Well, good morning and Shabbat Shalom. I'm Rabbi Ed Feinstein. This is Valley Best Shalom Torah study for a Shabbos morning. Joined this morning, as always, by my dear friend and teacher, Rabbi Mark Gelman. Good morning, Mark. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, my friend. Good to see you again. Um, this morning, we take up the, the second of a pair of Torah portions, which describe the commandments to create a holy place for the people of Israel and a system of holy worship. It's Parsha Titzavetz, toward the end of the book of Exodus. And the interesting part of the Parsha is that it deals with the vestments, the clothing, the garb of the holy priests. So what we have here is sacred haberdashery, sacred tailoring. Now, if we step back for just a moment and look at this as a cultural expression, I think there's a very deep message, very deep, interesting truth buried here. We go all the way back to the beginning of Genesis. Man, human beings are put into the Garden of Eden and they are naked and not ashamed. Arumim hem veloit boshashu, says the Torah. Works for me. And when they reach up and take the fruit and they become self-conscious, their very first act of self-consciousness is to cover themselves and create clothing. So the Torah's idea is that clothing is a consciousness that I am separate from you and you are separate from me, and I want to preserve my separateness, my privacy, by concealing the body, I'm also given the capacity of concealing parts of the self. And that clothing is both concealing and revealing. It protects the privacy. It, I show you as much of me as I'm willing to show you. Uh, the rest of me is covered, and that's considered both modest and private. And at the same time, as we well know, in a culture, especially a culture like ours, which is deeply conscious of its fashion, it is also deeply revealing the clothing we wear, the clothing, and in what time you wear certain kinds of clothing, uh, and how much of the body is permitted to be exposed, and what of the body is considered exposable, and what of the body is considered not. You know, reminded that at a certain point, a woman was never allowed to show her ankles, that was considered somehow obscene. And today, of course, if you happened upon a beach here in America, you see more of people's bodies than you probably want to be seeing. Um, in olden times, a glimpse of stocking was thought of as something shocking. Now, Evan knows anything goes. And, you know, you, you and turn on TV and you see, uh, again, bodies in certain ways that you would not have imagined. Um, and there's an interesting movement afoot. Um, to accept all kinds of bodies. There's a, a new ad campaign out from the Adidas company, which makes uh, sneakers and sportswear now. They've created a new line of sportswear for women, particularly sports bras. And the, the ad campaign is women of all different shapes and sizes wearing these, what would once be considered rather revealing uh, uh, outfits, but as a way of accepting different kinds of, uh, of, of bodies. And the clothing we wear, demonstrates this. The clothing we, we wear both conceals and reveals. It is a language um, that we speak. I, I'm reminded that I, I used to do a workshop with the teenagers at one of the local high schools. Um, and the, the, the workshop was on the, the topic of male and female relationships, of boy-girl relationships and sexual relationships and friendship relationships, the kinds of relationships kids find themselves into as they get deep into puberty and adolescence. And in one of our conversations with a wonderfully bright and sensitive group of young women, we ended up on this conversation about clothing uh, because they were complaining that the boys, you know, only look at them uh, in a certain way and they want to be taken more seriously as colleagues, as friends, as, and not simply as something that a boy looks at. And the, the question was, well, is the clothing you wear conducive to that? And there was this interesting conversation about you know, to what extent is the clothing we wear a message we send? And what's the language of the clothing that we wear? Uh, and it became a very wonderful conversation with these very, very bright young women um, who really became sensitive to the fact that, well, maybe what I wear communicates something that I don't intend. And, do, and while I want to cherish my freedom to wear what I want and to wear clothing that is com comfortable to me, at the same time, do, do I have a responsibility? Do I have an, a duty, a need to be sensitive to the message that I send through the clothing that I wear? And I suggested to them that 
in the Jewish faith, there is an ethic we call tzniut, which is modesty. And then they all have Orthodox cousins who, who wear very different kind of clothing than they wear, because there is a sensitivity to the message that clothing sends. Mark, talk to me about the clothing we wear. Yeah. You, you used to wear a bow tie and you were well known. That was your trademark. That was my trademark. And there's uh, it's probably tens or maybe hundreds, <laughs> maybe thousands of Christians out there who heard Tommy and I on the God Squad on ABC and wherever we were. And they actually wrote in and said, Is when did rabbis start wearing bow ties as their sign? Why did they give up the collar and take up the bow tie? <laughs> And I said, this is just a personal choice. And actually, it was it was intentional. I I started wearing bow ties because I was more comfortable with an open collar. But back in those days, you couldn't go on TV with an open collar. And so and I had to distinguish myself from Tommy. And so I had a yarmulke on usually, and that was one thing. But the, the bow tie was like, oh, yeah, the rabbi has the bow tie and the priest has the collar. So it was sort of way of differentiating. But there, there, there's an interesting thing about our vestments. And I'd like to say something about that, because that's what this Parsha is about, the vestments of the ancient high priest, which were basically linen trousers, a linen tunic, a thing called an ephod, which was a woven purple and gold mat. And on top of it, the chosha, the, the, the pounded out gold breastplate with 12 precious and semi-precious stones for each of the tribes. And in the middle, uh, <clears throat> a box that contained the urim and the thumim, had a word about that last week, uh, which we don't really know about. They were mysterious. They were some kind of apotropaic device, a kind of telling of the future. And they only the high priest knew how to use them, what they were, dice or bones or what, who knows. But that, and then the priest had a white turban. And also on top of the turban, across his forehead, a gold crown, really, a frontlet that had inscribed in it Kadosh Ladonai, holy to God. And at the fringes of the garment were rimonim, uh, pomegranate bells, shaped in, like a pomegranate. And when he walked, he made this tinkling sound that must have been very beautiful. And I would tell people, you know, about the lack of drama in Judaism, in modern Judaism, and how I bemoan that because I have a very dramatic sense. And I'm sad we lost it. I said at the close of the high holiday service at Nila, the high priest at the temple, and the temple was arranged so that when he had his fingers like this, making the Shaddai, the priestly blessing move, which one hand is Spock, be, live long and prosper, he would do this and the sun would set between his fingers. So now I said, imagine this, a man who, who tinkled while he walked, who's made a beautiful sound like a chime, purple and gold and precious stones and a gold crown and a turban and the sun moving from his fingers all the way over the congregation, and he would intone the blessing. Oh my God, I said, can you just imagine that kind of drama? I mean, you have to go to a, a, a Gothic cathedral like Chartres in the south of France to see what religious drama is about. And, and I do bemoan that our traveling around the world leached out of us, whether we ever, we had it at the temple, but certainly the rabbis were opposed to that. And it leached out of us our, our sense of drama. But now in the modern period, I like to bring people up to date. And I say, you know, the, the choices your rabbi makes on what they wear is also very revealing. 
Now, I know that you wear a robe on Yontif, on, on High Holiday. Custom in our community, right. Right. It's the custom, and you wear a white robe because it's white. You normally wear tachrichim, not a robe, mm -hmm. but the f burial shrouds that you will be buried in, and, and congregants are supposed to wear that too in Orthodox tradition because you're saying, look, God, if, if it's my time to go, I'm ready. I'm already dressed for my funeral. So the white robe is traditional for high holidays, but the robes we're wearing from Bentley and Simon are academic robes. They're not Jewish robes. They're from a, an academic house that makes robes basically for uh, British academics and American Protestant clergy. And during the year, we had a different practice. Your practice, as I have seen it and remember it, was you wear a suit for Friday night and Saturday morning. Saturday morning, you wear a talus over it, which is appropriate. Friday night, you don't wear a talus because you can't wear a talus on evening services in Judaism, according to Halacha, except for one service in the year, which is the Kol Nidre service, where you're supposed to wear white and wear your talus. So the robe that, so you wore a suit. Now, the suit sends a message. The message, who wears suits? The only other people who wear suits are guys who tell you, or women, who tell you, I'm sorry, your mortgage has not been approved. That's basically who wears suits. And, you know, particularly nowadays, suits and ties, nobody wears a tie. I mean, I'm in Florida, so absolutely no one. It's illegal to wear a tie, I think, here. But basically, no one wears ties in the modern patois. So, so you're saying, I'm, I'm, a com I'm dressed like a commercial businessman. Now, is that the right message? I don't think so. But on the other hand, I wore a robe, a black robe. And the black robe looks like a Protestant minister. Is that the right image? I don't think so either. So I, I was never comfortable, never comfortable on our clothing choices for the Bema and what they said about us. And of course, as for for regular wear, I, I don't feel at all inappropriate because it's Florida, which is an inappropriate state altogether. I don't feel, in a, I dress like a preppy. And the popped collar, this collar which you turn up, which is my trademark now since I don't wear bow ties. And the only one I ever know, knew who dressed this way was Johnny Miller, the golfer. He used to, that was his trademark, the popped collar. It's so preppy that no Jew has ever dressed this way except for me. And that's it, I think, pretty much. And, and that's what I do. And I wear a light sweater because I'm in an air-conditioned house that Betty feels comfortable being cold enough to have icicles for him. And so this is how I dress. And I have a yarmulke because I, I want, I may utter the name of God, and I don't want to utter the name of God without a yarmulke. And so that's, that's how I dress. Now, am I happy with dressing this way for Torah study? Yeah, I guess. But if you said you look like a preppy and you don't look like a rabbi, I'm, I'm willing to say, yeah, I guess you're right about that. But what does a rabbi look like in nowadays? So, so let me ask you, turn it on you. What should rabbis look like nowadays? Well, look, again, I, I want to I put this in a cultural context, the broader cultural context. I visited a church, very well-known, one of the well-known megachurches, to watch their service, which was fascinating. And the, the minister who's leading, there's a pastor who's leading the, ser the service and, and who's, um, who's giving the talk comes out in the chino pants and a Hawaiian shirt and sandals. Now, that's a very now that's a very conscious oh, choice yes. of uniform, because he is deliberately trying to say that the the distance between me and you is minimal. Right. He's trying very hard to push back what you call the Protestant tradition 
where the pastor is godly and the congregation is not, right? The, the vertical separation between the holy separation between pastor and congregation. And, and, he's, and the, the Hawaiian shirt is as folksy and as connected a garb as he can possibly imagine. Yeah, that's Rick Warren. Let's say what it is. There you go. So, Rick and, and, and but that's the, the but if you go on TV, if you watch, th this is not unusual now. In well, those, it is. Osteen dresses like a businessman in those churches, the different churches. But that's exactly the point, though. By paying attention to the dress of the pastor, in the same way that you pay attention to the dress of anyone who's in front of you, the clothing sends a message about how close we are, how far we are, about Absolutely. how formal, how formal this occasion is, right? I mean, one of the occasions in which we still dress up are for weddings. The bride wears a wedding dress. Now, there are, again, some brides who don't want to wear a wedding dress, and they come just wearing a dress, but there's always a sense of, gee, she's not wearing a wedding dress, because we expect the bride to be dressed in a unique uniform, and our culture has an idea of what that unique uniform is all about. And the groom, what does the groom wear, right? What does the, the, the person officiating the wedding wear? And it's a question of bridesmaids and groomsmen and what they wear. So this is one of those occasions, a wedding is one of those occasions where we're very conscious of the fact that the clothing sends a message of the sanctity and specialness of this moment, or if it's ignored, of, the, of, of a conscious rebellion against the sense of sanctity and specialness. Uh, you know, and then it gets kitschy in Las Vegas. You can have a guy who's dressed as Elvis come and perform your wedding, which is a, a real play on the idea that the clothing sends a message. It's yes, a I agree. Play. And, and there are other kinds of occasions like that where we expect people to dress in a certain manner. And I, it's just, to me, it's a very interesting question as a culture, you know, develops you know, what, what uniforms are accepted and what uniforms are not and what the uniform, the clothing says about us in the right, I can tell when, when I took groups to Israel I used to do Hasidic fashion shows where we would be in the bus and travel through Meir Sharim orthodox ultra orthodox areas and I knew back then I'd forgotten some of it of what each thing meant the, the fur hats the strimals were different for different sects Bova versus Giver the, the uh, Satmer they all had different and then the, if, but if you look in a normal, you know, metropolitan American town and you encounter Orthodox Jews, there's a costume too. And it includes clothing and facial hair and other things. Uh, you are, by the way, the perfect example of a conservative rabbi's facial hair. There's a thousand, thousand, thousand conservative rabbis who have that sort of beard, but it's a very neat trimmed beard. But it goes back to saying, like Orthodox rabbis have beards, we have beards, but they're very, they're sculpted and they're very, <laughs> very appropriate. So you are, an, uh, you are a perfect example. I'm a perfect example of a reform rabbi who has clean shaven and your mortgage has not been approved. And that's the way that we're supposed to look. And I think the notion of kedusha, of holiness, requires separation. The meaning of it is something kadosh, separated from the ordinary, separated from the ordinary. So this is why I have great anxiety about informal dress. It, and it carried over to people calling me Mark and just calling me Mark at the shul. I didn't like that. I, they knew I didn't like it. I was Rabbi Gelman. For my friends, I was Mark, but you know, I don't have any friends except you. So basically, there was no one who called me Mark. And and I think that's appropriate. You don't say, hey, Mark, how you doing? But there are rabbis I know, very wonderful rabbis. You know, one of my teachers, Arnie Wolf, may his memory be blessed, he was Arnie. Everyone knew him as Arnie, everyone. And so I, I am a fan of reducing informality to the point where you establish some special look that reminds people of sanctity. And I'm not sure how to do it. And today's informal world makes that almost impossible because rabbis are now 
incredibly informal. And it used to be also that wearing a yarmulke in synagogue was a big statement in, in our movement. There were reform temples where you could not wear a yarmulke. When I went to rabbinical school in Cincinnati at Hebrew Union College, one of the older professors reached into his suit coat on the first day of classes, pulled out a yarmulke, holding it like he was holding a dead fish, and said, gentlemen, I got this from the museum. And that was their view about it. So I, I belong to a generation of young rabbis yeah. who wanted very much to extinguish the idea that we had any magical powers and that we were in some way, we were all men at the time, that we were somehow holy men. So it was right. my generation of kids who had grown up in the 60s, um, who came to rabbinical school in the 70s, who wanted to be called by our first names, who wanted to go about without a tie on, who wanted to be, in, who, who brought the informality that you're talking about. And, and the reason was is because we saw there was a sort of arrogance uh, yeah. of, the, of the previous generations, um, you know, who thought of themselves as, you know, who, who lost their first names, for example, and everybody, including their spouses, called them rabbi, not the rabbi, but rabbi, and that the congregation treated them as holy men who had magical powers of healing and other kinds of things. And we pushed aside all that and said, you know, call me Eddie, and we'll, I'll be your friend, and we'll be close, and you'll know that I do this, but it's... It, and then I discovered, as so many of my colleagues did, that we still are magic. Yes. And to stand under the chuppah with a couple and recite those words is, uh, it's not me that's magic, of course. I'm a vessel of something that's bigger than me. Yeah, yeah. But I'm the conduit because at that moment in the tradition, there's a beautiful phrase for this. I am misader kiddushin, which technically means the organizer of the ceremony of the wedding. But it's more than that. Misader kiddushin means I am the conduit for holiness at that moment and there yes. is magic and my job is to create that magic same thing happens at a funeral service where yes. i create a mood because i want people to reflect on life and death as they think about the loss of a loved one or the death of a friend and they and it, it puts them into a certain mood um same thing on a shabbos morning you know to create a certain atmosphere um there's a sort of kind of shamanistic magic that goes along with it which and is a good thing. It, and that, yeah, and not just a good thing. It's inevitable, number one, and it is a good thing. And, yeah. it's, and it's something that I don't want to reject. I want to embrace it. I want to embrace it because I think it's part of the job. I mean, part of the responsibility of this role in the community. And so I think the question that you're raising is a fascinating question is, should the role be accompanied with some kind of magical dress? With a, now, I wear a talus, for example, when I do a wedding. <laughs> for a very simple reason. I once went to a wedding wearing a tuxedo because I was going to stay for the dinner afterwards. And a lady asked me for a dry martini with two olives. That's so funny. And I went to the bar and I got her the martini and I gave it to her. And then a few minutes later, I went and did the wedding. And that night she came to me and said, oh, you're the rabbi. I said, yes. She said, but I ordered. I said, yes, but I'm here to take care of you. You know, yeah. <laughs> but, That's funny. You know, of course, it was Tommy who gave me the same insight that you got. Uh, one day, because he used to show up at all our services, because Saturday wasn't a big day for him, but Sunday was. And so he would show up and sit on the bima with me, which freaked out a lot of people. I had a, a mother, a grandma, who wouldn't, was thinking of not coming to her own grandson's bar mitzvah because of our organ. And then in the service, Tommy shows up, walks up to the bima with his collar, sits down next to me, and the woman turns to her daughter and says, you know, maybe the organ wasn't so bad. <laughs> so the thing, so Tommy said to me once, why don't you, when you're blessing the children, why don't you put your hands on their head? Mm. And this was way before, you know, inappropriate touching or any of that stuff, which it isn't, but it was way before that. But, and I said, because I don't want them to think I'm a shaman. And he said, but you are. And he said, how many really dear friends do you have in the congregation? I said, some, but not that many. And he said, that's the same reason that the shaman lived outside the village. Shamans never lived in the village. They lived outside because they were mana. 
they had the special powers. And I used to see it mostly, and I embraced it at in the hospital room. I would go and I would always be respectful. I'd say, uh, can I, do you, do you feel comfortable if I blessed you? And the percentage of people who said, yes, I would feel comfortable if you blessed me was in the 100% range. And, and I would say, can I place my hands on your head and bless you? Because I wanted to make sure. And they said, yes, yes. And I would do that and bless them with my fingers touching their head and do the Rafur Shlema prayer. And a woman later on afterwards said, you know, when you touched me, I felt that there was like a, a power coming through your fingers into my body. And I, I was very moved by it. And I accepted what she said as the truth, that, there, that this notion of being a conduit of power, healing power. Now, of course, atheists and others who don't believe in this will say, yeah, so why weren't you the conduit to power when you visited someone and you blessed them and then they died? You know, w where was your conduit to power there? Chacham. And, and they have a point. And this isn't a matter of magical. It's not magic. If it was magic, if I put my hand on her head, said the right words, she should be healed. But it's not magic. But it is saying what I do believe, that the most difficult thing for clergy, baby clergymen and women to learn, the most difficult thing is how to be a shaman, mm -hmm. how to embrace the notion that you're not, hey, I'm Craig, your pal. No. You're not their pal. You're going to bury their father, their mother, maybe, God forbid, their children. When you bury a person's child, you're not their friend. You're not their pal. You're, you're someone who can touch a world that is so fearful and so full of holiness and so remote and so terrifying that only you can touch it without being killed. Mm. And you do that for them. And you carry and you say, I'm going to bring you through this valley of death. I'm going to you just hang on to me and, and we're going to walk through it together. And of all the rabbis I have ever known, among all of them, you are the very best at doing that, Eddie, the very best. And it's because of the warmth of your soul and because you've accepted the notion that you're a shaman. That's my compliment for you for today. Thank, thank you. That was very kind. The reason why you, we can't cure is because we pray for two things. You pray rifuata nefesh, rifuata guf. I can't do rifuata guf. That's for the doctor to do. That's biochemical. But you're praying rifuata guf. But I can pray rifuata nefesh. I can help someone. But your prayer includes both. Of course, of course. But I don't have that power. But, but I can make somebody know they're not alone. I can help someone find the courage to move forward. I can't help, I can focus them on gratitude instead of fear. I can do a lot of things to help their nefesh, their soul, even if I can't find the biochemistry to cure the tumors of their body, right? The, the other, I mean, the parallel thing here that I think is so interesting is the physician. We had a conversation with some physicians this week and, uh, you know, and, and what's happened to doctors in our culture. Um, first of all, it's interesting, we're talking about sacred garb, the ceremony for the investiture of a physician is called the white coat ceremony. It's when a doctor in their third year of medical school is given a white coat. The white coat is the vestment of the oh, physician yeah. who wears it in the hospital, which says, I am not you. I am not a patient. I am not an orderly. I am somebody special here because I have accepted the responsibility of being a healer in this place. And the shamanistic part that you talked about is also true in the field of medicine. I mean, I had this experience myself when I, when, I was, when I was ill. I had cancer some years ago, and I had a very, very accurate set of, um, of uh, CAT, scan, uh, CAT scan images. But when I visited physicians for a second and a second, third opinions, each of them looked at the CAT scan and said, fine, get up on the table. 
get up on the table, take your clothes off, get up on the table. And each of them did the exact same thing. They washed their hands. They came over to me and they put their hands on my body, on my abdomen. And I realized very quickly that there's nothing their fingers were going to feel that the CAT scan didn't show them. This was not diagnostic. This was shamanistic. This mm -hmm. was a, an ancient, ancient rite of saying, I am a healer and I am here to fight for your life, to give you my, well, the Chinese word is chi, my, my healing energy to take your pain away. And I will be your, your partner in fighting for life against death. And it was a very powerful experience because these were souls and they were, there happened to be men and women that I really loved and who loved me and, and communicated that, but they weren't doing it as my friend. No. They were doing it in the role, in the sacred role of healer, which is a sacred role we assign to certain special people in our culture. And we dress them that way. We, and then we're, you know, wearing a stethoscope is part of the garb. It's part of it. Like I wear film. He wears a, spe a stethoscope, which says I am, I have this special role in the community. No, that's right? absolutely right. And the sense of, of, of shamanism is, it, it's absolutely essential for, for us to understand that we're not just teachers. They say a rabbi is a teacher. And I always correct people. I said, first of all, the word rabbi does not mean teacher. Moreh is a teacher, Morah. The what is Rav? Rav doesn't mean teacher. As a Rav means master. He's like a Zen Roshi. The Roshi in Zen is, the, is like a Rav. It means you are the master of some spiritual healing that I am not the master of. And that's where you, you fit. And you know, my doctorate is in medical ethics. So I read widely and I was the chairman of the Jewish Medical Ethics Committee in New York with Moshe Tendler and J David Blythe and others, Fred Rosner, an amazing group. And one of the studies that I read back in those days was a study, Eddie, of uh, blood pressure people take they did a study of thousands of patients who had their blood pressure taken with a machine. The collar had, was on their arm and they would, you know, some machine would automatically take their blood pressure like you have in a hospital. They wire you up for that. And then the second group had their blood pressure taken by a human being who held their hand, touched, and it was the same people who had the blood pressure taken both ways. See? And what they discovered is your blood pressure, the blood pressure was lower when a human being held their hand. So there's evidence, there's evidence that this shamanistic touching is real. Mm -hmm. That there's something about the energy, chi you said, or you know, the the energy fields, whatever it is the uh, the chakras I, that they have a se real sense of in the East. And we don't have at all a sense of it in our tradition. So yeah, all of that is is really important. And it's very, it's very easy to teach people to be Jewish teachers. There, you just say, here's some information you didn't know, learn it and go teach people this is information. It is nearly impossible to teach people how to be rabbis in my view it is something in which basically it's like finding a buddha when this when the dalai lama dies they're going to find a new dalai lama and they they don't know really how to do it but they have a system of ancient origin where they just look at objects that were owned by different young Buddhist monks and they feel them, they touch them, they look at, and then they say that thing, who owned that, that thing? And then they bring them in and they do other things. And that person is the new Buddha. So it's like that. And, and I would tell people that they should be rabbis 
who knew nothing about Judaism. They were Jewish, of course, but, and I, they'd say, why would you recommend that? I don't, I said, because every quality you can't teach a rabbi, you already know. Mm. And I'm still most proud of the fact that many of my students at Northwestern became rabbis. Nami Kelman was my student at Northwestern, Wolf Kelman's daughter, and uh, several others. Um, Jack Moline and was my student, and Don Ross, a whole bunch. I'm very proud of all of them. And I think it was because I had a sense of you know, who I was talking to that these are people who have a spiritual calling that they aren't aware of. And the reason that I was able to do that was that that's how Nelson Glick approached me. He said, you will be a rabbi and you'll be a, a, a good rabbi, a very good rabbi. And you will, he was wrong about that, but he was right about the fact that I was a rabbi. Would be, and he didn't, and I said, how do you know that? Nelson, and he said, there are things I know that you also know, but you will need years to learn how you know them. Mm -hmm. It's not a matter of you learning things. Everything you learn to be a rabbi is irrelevant. It'll be important, but irrelevant, ultimately. What, what's really important is what you know now, and you're not aware of that. And I remember once Richard Rubenstein, my other teacher, I was one of the youngest people to ever be asked by the CCAR to do an address to the plenary. And I gave a lecture, a very highfalutin phenomenological lecture on why the Torah was revealed by God, how we can believe that as reformed Jews. And I finished and we had a discussion and Richard spoke up and he said, it's obvious to me that at some point the reform movement and the Jewish world will benefit greatly from the teaching of Mark Gelman, but it won't happen until he's over 50. And I was 21 at the time. Wow. And, and, and I thought it was the most backhanded compliment insult that I had ever, ever received in my life until years later, I realized that it was completely true. Sure. And that when I see how you work now, you know, in retirement and, and my being an emeritus, and, and I realized in far, so far from being finished with our work, this is the best time of our work. That's how I feel it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you feel the same way, because everything I've learned went into this moment right. and what I teach now. Yeah. My yeah. sermons are deeper. My teaching is deeper. And it's because it took this long. It took this long to get it sorted out. Mm. That you don't, you don't train to be a shaman. You just are. Mm -hmm. And if you're lucky to have teachers who can point to you and say, yeah, you're the local Buddha. You're the one. Mm. Then your life is changed. So. Well, this, this morning we've become very self-confessional. Yeah. So for, for everyone who's enjoying this and listening, thank you for uh, listening to our confessions. The, the Torah is all about the priesthood, which is an institution hasn't existed in the Jewish world in 2000 years. Um, and it's about the vestments of the priest, the garments, the, uh, the outer garments that clothe the Kedusha and communicated the holiness, the Kedusha, the specialness and separateness of the priestly class. And what Mark, what Rabbi Gelman and I are, are, are trying to suggest is that far from being irrelevant and from being, um, you know, in, in, no longer in force, non-operative, th these concepts of the holiness that inheres in certain characters in our culture, the holiness that we invest in certain characters, certain people in our environment, the holiness that we find in one another, and the way that we show it by clothing them in certain ways and surrounding them with a certain aura is terribly important and still very, very much part of the lives that we live. So let me wish you, Mark, and everyone listening, a very good Shabbos. Um, it is Super Bowl weekend, so 
uh, enjoy the game and be careful uh, while watching it, of course. And then on Monday, is there's a Valentine's Day. So we offer you our, our, our love for hearts and loves and kisses on that day. Uh, and to everyone, a good Shabbos today and stay well. Good Shabbos, my friend.